Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, September 11th, and this is the weekly market update. First thing I'd like to say is to uh, commemorate the 20 year anniversary. It's kind of solemn of the uh, attack on the World Trade Center. Um, I don't want to say too much about it on this particular podcast. I'll probably have more to say about it in the reality check, which I will have on other channels besides YouTube. Um, but suffice to say, it's just uh, kind of one of the defining moments in my life, just because I guess for a previous generation, you know, you kind of, I heard people say they kind of knew where they were when Kennedy got shot. And I, I remember exactly where I was when the Twin Towers uh, were attacked. I was actually on shift in the Power 3 block of the Texas City Refinery. And we had the uh, TV on in there. We had a TV in there that had like public service for the refinery. Um, but then they put it on when the towers got attacked, they put it on the, the news on. So it was shocking, I remember. Um, but anyway, uh, it kind of uh, defined my, you know, 30s and 40s of my life. Uh, and I never forgot what, what happened. I never forgot the heroics not just the military people, but a lot of the firefighters and a lot of regular people um, that uh, did things. And uh, some of the stories that I've read recently of people that were forgotten, people that did things. You know, one fellow that uh, was on his way home uh, from Ohio, I believe, to Denver. It's a pretty good story. And um, the plane had to be grounded in Omaha, Nebraska. And so before the thing even touched down, the guy was on the phone renting a van. So he rent the, rented the biggest van he could. Uh, I think it would hold eight people. And then he got a piece of cardboard and a magic marker from somebody in the airport and said he was going to Denver. And he started finding other folks that wanted to go with him. And so he drove them. They drove to Denver from Omaha in this van, rental van. And he dropped each individual person off around the Denver metro area, wherever they lived. And if you know anything about Denver, it's pretty spread out. So uh, this guy uh, ended up refusing any kind of money or reimbursement for gas or for the rental. So there are little stories like that. that I think that, you know, I think it, one of the things it did that I remember that we're missing nowadays is it really brought the country together. Um, notwithstanding the fact, if you want to get into why it happened or how it happened, you know, we kind of put aside a lot of our differences and you heard a lot of stories like that. A lot of people helping each other, putting aside differences of po politics or race or economic class or whatever. And I kind of miss that because we're very polarized now and uh, we're in a, we're in a bad spot. So I just wanted to mention that, uh, but we'll go into the, uh, the market update. Uh, again, this is uh, not to be taken as investment advice. Anything you hear here is for informational and educational purposes only. I am not a financial advisor. I'm just a guy on the internet. Um, you don't know me. I don't know you. Uh, these ideas that I come up with, you should do your own due diligence on, especially if you're going to invest real money. It's your money. It's your responsibility. Okay. Wow. Uranium is the story. Here is the chart of the Sprott Trust, if you will. Um, as you can see, if you go here to the right, you see that basically we're in an uptrend. This is the previous, I guess, also price of the UPC you know, before it converted into a trust, Sprott took over. This is approximately when things really got cooking back here. Look at the volume, look at the amount of money and shares that have, have been bought. Look at what happened. Look at this uh, big blast off, if you will. And, uh, you know, this is, this is extremely bullish. Now, I will say that this is from a technical basis. If you look at uh, other indicators on here, which I'm not able to show on this chart, um, I mean, on relative strength, it's off the charts, it's showing overbought. Moving averages are showing overbought. So that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to pull back um materially you, we are in a bull market now we are we have lit the match on the brush pile that was had gasoline dumped over it so i don't know how hot this gets and so there's been a lot of people that are new subscribers to this channel there's a lot of new people coming into this i've got 
a frenzy going on. People, young guys I work with, I mentioned this to them and I turned them on to read some of the stuff. And right off the bat, you know, people want to get into this. You know, they hear the story um, and they get excited. FOMO starts kicking in. We've talked about FOMO before, fear of missing out. Um, you haven't missed out. Uh, you know, we're not even at the ballpark yet. Forget about what inning we're in. We're just, the, the, the team bus is now just pulling up to the stadium. We, we really haven't got going yet. So I think we have a lot longer to go, a lot higher to go. I don't think anyone knows what's really going to happen. No one really knows how much material is out there that this uh, trust can soak up. Um, but I will tell you that I've already heard some things that bother me. Again, the same canards that we've heard in the past are being surfaced again. Uh, well, if the price goes up, Kaz Adam Prom will just flood the market. If the price goes up, Cameco will just bring all these mines back online. Uh, if the price goes up, all these mines that uh, are on care and maintenance. What all, where are all these mines that are on care and maintenance? So you have Langer Heinrich, for example, it's been sitting there for years on supposed care and maintenance. I haven't been to the plant. I don't know if they're doing all the preventive maintenance on the motors and on the bearings that they're supposed to be doing. They say it's on care and maintenance, but it's Namibia. I, I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know what standards they're using there. Um, and regardless, if you want to crank these things back up, it's not just like flipping a light switch. Now, they will inevitably be brought back online. The price will get, so we can suppose at least, to a sufficient level that would make economic sense. But we don't know uh, what that price is. We don't know what condition the machinery is. We don't know where the skilled people are. They've moved on, a lot of them, into other jobs. So you have to get the people back if they're available. If not, you have to hire new people. They have to be trained. Um, these are, you know, this isn't, you know, making, uh, you're not making, you know, paper bags or egg carton holders. This is, uh, you know, this is a pretty involved process in uh, taking ore and transforming it into yellow cake. So it's not... Uh, something that can just be the flip of the switch. Now, if the price gets high enough, enough capital will come in and it will fix the problems. But I, I just get a little bit perturbed when I hear people say, this, people that don't know anything about predictive or preventive maintenance, don't know anything about machinery maintenance, don't know anything about, you know, like getting skilled people back to work, uh, what it takes to get a process unit up and running with people that aren't skilled the mistakes that go. And so these things can all be overcome, but it won't be something that if the price was to get to, you know, $65, $70, that within a month, all this uranium would come flooding into the market. It simply isn't going to happen like that. So, um, you know, you'd be looking at a year, year, year and a half, two years, right? Before all this stuff would, would really get cranked up and be reliable. So I think there's a big window of opportunity here. So I will caution people that uh, the recommendation I've made all along since I've been talking about uranium, and I've been talking about this uranium story, the supply, demand, mismatch, and the inevitability of this bull market. Now, I did not know anything about the Sprott deal. I did not know what the catalyst would be, but I knew inevitably the, the fact that the price was well below uh, the production cost meant that the industry was in liquidation. You were not bringing new mines, you were not bringing new resources online. And so inevitably that would lead to a price rise. Um, we're just in the right spot at the right time when you see these uh, situations like the Sprott deal. And uh, so, you know, I'll take it, right? I'd rather be lucky than good. So the other thing I want to dispel a lot of you on, and I don't mean this to be negative or anything, you need to be aware of it though. Most of the little juniors trading sardines that are calling themselves uranium exploration or development companies will never produce a pound of uranium. Let me say that again. Most of the little rinky dink companies that you're looking at will never produce a pound of uranium. Certainly not in this cycle. Um, there are plenty, there's plenty of uh, capacity to fulfill the demand for uranium. Um, and at a certain price, they'll come online. Uh, I never want to say never, but most of these things will never produce a pound of uranium. They're trading sardines. They're speculative entities. They are burning matches. So, you know, 
If you want to be an investor, if you want to look at the risk curve, there's nothing wrong with just buying the trust, okay? There's nothing wrong with just scaling in over the time, over the next, you know, putting, you know, whatever amount in an equal amounts every month or every other week or however you want to do it and just buy the trust on dips or whatever. Um, there's a good chance we could see a spike. You know, what happens in a lot of these commodity markets is that they tend to, um, they tend to go to extremes on both the downside and the upside. Um, you'll hear a lot of talk about the marginal cost of production, whatever that is, $60, $70 a pound, whatever that ends up being. Very rarely do these commodities trade around that. They usually, uh, as I said before, you know, if you have a, a demand, let's say, for a million pounds of uranium, and this is just for illustration purposes, and there's, you know, this feed is needed to power billion dollars worth of assets, i.e. reactors, and the the demand is exactly a million pounds and there's only a 900,000 pounds available, the price is going to go through the roof. The marginal pound, the, the, 100, the one millionth in one pound sets the price for all the other pounds because people will pay whatever's required to keep their asset running. And so that's why you have price spikes. Conversely, it works the other way. If, if the demand, if the supply of uranium is a million pounds a year, and the demand's only 900,000 and the price will go down way below the median cost because there's a surplus. And this, is, this doesn't just apply to uranium, it applies to most, well, if not all commodities in the resource sector. And my, many people miss this. This is why when people say, well, we could exceed the price very easily of the last bull market. Yes, it's very, that's pretty typical of what happens in a lot of commodity bull markets. Or when, when a commodity comes out of a long bear market, there's been so much supply destruction that it just takes years to get the capital, both uh, money and human capital, to build the mines. I mean, if you just go out and find a really good asset right now that you could develop, um, first of all, you couldn't get the money to build the thing right now, not at the current uranium price. Let's assume it gets to some price that's, you know, that your feasibility study says is reasonable and you, and you bank this and you get a bank to back you. By the time you get through all that, by the time you get through all the proving up, finishing up, proving up all the geotechnicals, the engineering for the plant, the mine, long lead time items procurement, uh, not to mention the permitting, dealing with uh, who knows what NGOs and government interference and First Nations and every, everybody else that doesn't want a uranium mine anywhere near them. Then you actually get the stuff on site. Then you get the construction company, EPC contractor in there. Long story short, you're, you're going to be doing, it's going to take you years, five to 10 years, depending on the jurisdiction. I don't know. And so a lot of these little rinky dink juniors are trading sardines. That doesn't mean some of them won't go up 10, 20, 50, a hundred times. Uh, but what I'm telling you is that's way on the risk curve. So what I recommend to people is if you want to stay on the low end of the risk curve, which is this whole thing is, is, is still, you know, it's not, this is not, you know, widows and orphan stuff by any means, regardless, but you want to stay lower risk, just buy the uranium. I mean, if it goes, this is probably going to maybe at least the marginal cost of production, you got a double. If you go to a hundred, 200, I mean, you, you could, you're looking at, uh, you know, five times your money. If you want a little bit more juice, buy one of the ETFs, like URNM or something like that, okay? Then you're getting a good uh, market cap weighted uh, spread. If you want to get more aggressive, then you're going to have to do more research or subscribe to somebody or listen you know, to somebody that knows what they're talking about because there's 60, between 60 and 70 of these companies out there right now. By the time this bull market is over, there'll be hundreds. Let me say that again. By the time this bull market is over, there'll be hundreds, if not more, uh, of these little rinky-dink uranium companies. Uh, as I've said before, the people in Vancouver and Toronto will not have a problem creating uranium companies to feed the retail interest that comes along. And they'll all have a story. And you can go to Vancouver when they have the resource shows and walk through the hall, uh, the exhibit hall, and every one of them will have a, a, a story about how they're the next whatever, next gen or Cameco or whatever. Okay, so know that going in. Know that these are trading sardines. 
Okay. And I, I, I just see some of the comments that I see people say, oh yeah, this is management. I mean, how many competent uranium teams are there that know the pecu peculiarities of hard rock mining for uranium vis-a-vis -vis ISL or, you know, and, and, and know the geology and have built uranium and ran a uranium mine. There's not that many. There's not 60. I'll tell you that there certainly isn't going to be three or 400 or 500 or whatever they end up with. So keep that in mind. That doesn't mean you can't trade these. It doesn't mean you can't speculate, but these are not investments. The only investable companies are Kaz, Adam, Prom, and maybe Cameco. Okay. The rest of them are not investable. They're not investments. They are speculations. They are trading sardines. They are burning matches. So just be aware of that. I just want to get that out there because this is one of the things that I had to learn the hard way. Okay. Don't be a linear thinker. There will be dips. This, this is not going to go straight up every day, uh, regardless of what you might think. There will be pullbacks. There will be opportunities to enter. There will be opportunities to put your cash to work. Okay. Watch these. Watch these uh, markers here, the 50 day and the 200 day. Okay. You're way, we are way, way above these moving averages. They will begin to turn up as the days tick off, but we, we typically stocks trade along these things as markers. Okay. So it's not a bad idea, maybe to say you were going to put uh, 10 units in, let's call it units, whatever your cash levels are. Uh, you know, it's not a bad thing if you just want to, you know, maybe commit one or two units immediately, and then you just scale into this thing on pullbacks and tranches. Okay. Uh, just to shoot your whole wad when this thing is way overbought, here's what happens. The guy does that because he's got FOMO and he's got visions of sugar plums. He does that. The thing pulls back to the, uh, you know, 12, he's, he's down 30% and he gets disillusioned. He, you know, he doesn't know the fundamentals because he's not in for the right reasons, doesn't understand the thesis, doesn't get it. He's just running off emotion. Don't be that guy. There's plenty of money to be made here. Okay. Now it would have been better when you were buying these stocks two years ago, like I was, that's why I've got multi baggers already, but that's, that, that's the easy money that's been made. So now it's just a matter of scaling in. You're in a bull market. You see what's happening with the sprot situation. You see the bullishness. And like I said, we're just, you know, we're just getting warmed up here. So I just wanted to put that, that out. That's just a little bit of uh, people ask me, what would I do? That's what I would do. So I want to give some information um, about some other things that people aren't talking about. It's not just all about sprot. We've talked about this before over the last couple of years on this channel of why we are bullish, why I'm bullish on uranium. And here's another reason. Uh, Illinois nuclear reactors got a major life extension last night in a Senate vote. Tw um, 20 plus years of 3 million pounds a year added to the demand models. Illustration of how powerful license extensions and restarts will be. So that's what we've been talking about, right? The uh, Byron and Dresden stations are two big uh, ComEd stations in Illinois, I believe. I believe they're ComEd. I know Byron is because I built a wind farm right next to it or literally next to it. But anyways, they were going to phase these things out. And what's becoming more realized by politicians and policymakers is that whether or not you believe in global warming or all that, not, let's, let's stay away from that. Policymakers are going to move towards less carbon emissions. That's what they want to do. They're not going to get there by building rebuildables. Uh, they're starting to realize that. The goals are not being met uh, by throwing up all these wind farms. Now, that's going to be part of the uh, mix, but we have these huge generators, base load generators, there's nuclear power. We already have put the carbon in the atmosphere to make the steel and concrete that took to build them. What sense does it make to shut them down when they're producing CO2 free electricity in huge quantities? And that's starting to be realized. It's starting to be realized and even said by some policymakers that it will be impossible. Let me say that again. It will be impossible to reach the stated climate goals without nuclear power. So it makes no sense economically, philosophically, politically to shut these things down and then think you're going to do, you know, put solar panels up in Illinois. So uh, there was a lot of lobbying that went on, especially by a lot of the labor unions, IBEW. There were some activists. We featured the one, uh, I tried to get an interview with her, but it never came through. They did a lot of lobbying. They were out at the plants. They uh, worked with the um, 
uh, IBW, Atomic Workers, all these different folks that uh, whoever's representing the power plant guys now, I don't know, uh, and those nuke plants, but you know, they got this uh, at least through, I think, the one side of the legislature in Illinois. And you're seeing more of this around the world. We've already seen life extensions on different plants. You know, they go in there and say, well, this thing was originally built with a lifespan of, you know, 50 years. And we went in here like all the concrete steel still looks good. Believe me, there's all kinds of testing, x-rays, non-destructive testing going on in these plants. They started realizing I mean, these things are pretty robust. We can continue to run them safely. So we will continue to run them. So I think you'll see more of that, not less. This is a good omen. These are very large plants. That's 3 million pounds a year of uh, uranium just for these two units. So uh, S&P, they had an article uh, on uranium price jump. I will uh, put a link to the, to the show notes. Nothing really surprising, but I just wanted to show how the story is starting to leak into more mainstream media outlets. So what do they say? A Canadian investment fund almost single-handedly launched uranium spot prices into orbit with a buying spree that has put the nuclear power industry on alert. The spot uranium price, well, it goes through this, blah, blah, blah. Uh, market analyst credited Sprott Asset Management, LP, a uranium trust formed in July to buy up low-cost uranium on the spot market and hold it for the long term for jolting the market with a wave of purchases. Yeah, that's exactly right. The nuclear power industry, which largely buys fuel on long-term contracts, is not panicking as it can absorb even a one-third increase in price. But the industry is wary that the fund could continue to push up fuel costs. Well, that's what we want it to do. It's time for these guys to get off the duff and quit living off uh, you know, cheap uranium and start signing the long-term contracts that they need to sign. And so uh, you know, I, I, I saw a thing on Twitter, Nick Jones, uh, Grain Jones, at Grain Jones. Uh, he had some conversations, I think, uh, where some people informed him that some of these, uh, a couple of the, uh, the um, or at least one, maybe two that I thought, I, I can't remember. And this is all hearsay, but it makes sense. Um, he had heard that uh, a couple of fuel buyers had actually called Sprott and said, like, what's an ATM? I mean, what's going on here? What are you guys trying to do? They have no, they're clueless. Um, no one was anticipating this. And so uh, it continues to work. Like I said, you can follow Alex Weinstein's uh, Google document that he updates every business day at 7 p.m. And you can see all the data. Uh, he gleans it, I think, off the uh, trust website. It's right there. How many pounds were bought, the total amount of pounds that have been bought, the total amount of funds committed, yada, yada, yada. So here's some more good news. Japanese prime, prime minister candidate says nuclear is essential. Uh, here's a uh, tweet. Uh, shares of Japanese utilities jumped after Kono Taro, a leading contender to become prime minister, said restarting nuclear reactors was necessary to achieve the country's green goals. Not only that, they're paying like $20 an uh, uh, MMBTU for LNG. They have no choice. Japan has no natural resources. It imports all of its energy. They cannot, you know, natural gas is in short supply. We're going to talk about that in a later slide. They even have the UK starting up coal plants because gas, gas prices are, are, are out of control. I'm talking about natural gas. That was going to be the transition fuel, right? It's going to be cheap forever. There's an overabundance of gas. Another canard, another uh, wrong uh, prediction by the uh, mainstream. And so TEPCO, which is actually the, I believe it's the utility that actually owns Fukushima, surged 11%. Biggest gain since 2016. So the Japanese have no choice, really, right? They have to, um, and they will. They have started a few reactors, but I think this gets accelerated, and they build more. I mean, nuclear power is a growing growing business. We've said that. You can go to the, uh, I think it's the World Nuclear Association or one of the nuclear websites, and they list all the operating reactors, all the reactors currently under construction, all the ones in planning, and all the proposed. And it's in the hundreds they're going to build hundreds of these things over the next 20 or 30 years. So uh, this is not an industry that's going away, much to the consternation of some of the environmental nut jobs. Here we go. Germany, another country. You know, Angela Merkel now has left, has retired as the chancellor of Germany, I think after 16 years, something like that, 12 or 16 years. And, you know, the initial knee-jerk reaction after Fukushima was they were going to accelerate uh, 
the closing of their reactors. And that was stupid. You know, they had the energy transition, which I can't pronounce in German, energy vende or something like that. Anyways, it means energy transition. Spent $600 billion and basically didn't hardly make a dent in their CO2 emissions and ended up burning more coal because you need to have these large baseload nuclear stations. You've already got the sunk carbon cost and the sunk money. It's a sunk cost. It's just sitting there. And uh, but you have a very strong environmental lobby in Germany, Greens, and you, you may have seen the uh, little stickers or pro posters. They have the little atom that says uh, atom croft, which means nuclear power. No, no, dunk it. No, dunk. I mean, no, thank you. And I have T-shirts that say atom craft. Yes, please. So uh, yeah, ja, ja I think is how you say it. But anyways, uh, um Necessity. We said that in the Malcolm Rawlingson interview three years ago, two and a half, three years ago, we talked about this, Malcolm and I, what was going to inevitably happen, what inevitably was going to happen to wake people up out of this ridiculous fantasy land that solar panels, Al Gore's pizza farts and windmills were going to bring us to the next, you know, energy transition was higher prices. And that's what's happening. Power prices are exploding all over Europe. The energy crisis is creeping onto us, okay? Gas prices, regardless of what's going on with Nord Stream 2 and Gazprom not necessarily supplying like they should or could, uh, that's a whole other discussion, but we're seeing tightening energy markets and for various reasons. And, you know, people are starting to realize, look, we're not going to hit our goals if you are, if that's your goal uh, is climate uh, dealing with the CO2 without nuclear powers. We have more and more people. That's why we talk about this in actionable intelligence. It's intelligence. It's actionable. What's really happening? They're not going to tell you this. I'm going to show you what kind of stupid crap they talk about on the mainstream over this. They don't, they don't even have a clue. They're out in left field. They're out to lunch. They were Charlie Gasparino was talking about this the other day with Liz Clayman on Fox Business. Clueless. Okay? Don't have a clue what's going on. So... That's how you're going to, that's how you're going, you know, the man with the best information usually comes out ahead. And, uh, you know, we've been on this story from day one. This is what you've got to be looking at. You get deep dive, the second and third level thinking, not just, well, I saw this in a tweet on Wall Street uh, uh, bros or bets or whatever, or, you know, John said this on a YouTube video. Why is, why am I saying this? What's the rationale? What's the, what's the thinking behind this? And so here it is, right? Mainstream media on the uranium trade, lots of laughs. So we made the news here. I'll put a link to this little clip. Um, basically, you know, it was a whole lot of nothing. They didn't talk about the Sprott Trust. They didn't talk about really anything. It was just a lot of grab bag. Uh, this stuff's up, so we need to talk about it. And I'll just make a BS, you know, off the cuff answer. And that's what they did. And they're, they're clueless. They don't have a clue what's going on. But, uh, you know, they will. And, you know, I tease Justin Hewn, UraniumInsider.com, that uh, one of my sell indicators is going to be when they have him on CNBC or one of these uh, Fox Business or BNN, then I'll know that uh, when uh, somebody like that makes it on that, you know, kind of knows what they're talking about, that they, um, that'll be the time to sell, right? Because it went, have went mainstream. But I'll put a link to this video. It's about two minutes. It's totally stupid. I don't really blame them. They are who they are. Uh, they're always wrong. They've never been right about anything. So I haven't forgotten about oil. You know, Brent still trading at over 70. WTI hovering around a little bit of 70, drops back to 68, 69, 71, hanging around $70 a barrel. And what we're starting to see is, you know, I'm looking at the um, disease that cannot be mentioned um, uh, data on Worldometer and, you know, in a lot of places, if you look at the world as a whole, infections and deaths are rolling over. Now, uh, many countries are rolling over. Um, they're going down for whatever, however reasons, I don't know, but they are. And so what we, what, what, what I'm hopeful for and what we're anticipating is, is that a return to some type of normalcy, economic activity, consistent economic activity, and then an increase that all ties back to energy usage, right? People don't want to either understand that or acknowledge that, that if you want to have more activity, it requires energy. That's all it is, right? You know, energy holds back in entropy or helps you overcome entropy, right? Take 
chaos and turn it into order requires energy, economic uh, activity, agriculture, anything you want to think about, transforming metals into other things or raw materials into refined products. It all takes tremendous amounts of energy. So uh, I'll put a link to all these articles like I do usually in the show notes. Some of the world's biggest economies are seeing oil consumption turn the corner and even surpass pre-pandemic levels as falling uh, infection rates drive a recovery in activity. Oil demand in China, the world's top energy consumer, will be 13% higher next quarter than in the same period in 2019 before the pandemic, according to SIA Energy. Indian fuel sales extended a rebound last month, while American consumption of petroleum just hit a record high. Europe was also, has also just had its best August for gasoline demand in 10 years. Quote, the worst for Asian fuel demand is over, and we see a soft recovery of oil demand in the coming months, an analyst at Beijing-based SIA. China's overall oil consumption will be led by more than a 20% jump in gasoline use next quarter from 2019. And so we've talked about this ad nauseum. Um, this is why we're going to have an energy crisis, in my view. Uh, demand goes up by approximately 1% to 1.5% or 2% in a good year uh, for oil every year, uh, unless you have like a crisis like we just had or the great financial crisis. Okay. And so... At 100 million, right before the pandemic, we had about 100 million barrels a day of demand, 32, 33 billion barrels a year of demand. That's growing at, like I said, one to 2% a year. You throw in the fact that if you want to look at the entire uh, oil and gas industry, a 7% Exxon said in their research, 7% decline rate per year. Uh, so that means you have to find and bring on every year the equivalent of a Saudi Arabia every year to meet the new demand and to meet the uh, overcome the depletion from the declines from being from the producing assets. And we haven't done that. That requires, as I've said before, hundreds of billions of dollars to be invested and recycled back into exploration, production, uh, you know, advanced recovery, whatever you want to talk about. And it hasn't happened because prices were so jacked up for a while. We had, you know, basically a depression level activity in the oil and gas market. Prices, you know, went negative. There was no cash flow to recycle into these uh, finding new um, new resources. And so, if you have a extractive industry that you don't uh, replace the assets, uh, you go out of business eventually. Uh, you living off your previous investments, and that's not sufficient for the growth and the declines. And so we're running into that. Now you throw on the ESG mandates, the new zeitgeist, if you will, of the West, the economic sepiku of trying to get rid of oil and gas, okay, where you have the IEA, which was created during the Arab oil embargo to help ameliorate uh, shortages uh, is now saying that there should be no more exploration for oil. And so you pile this stuff on and you're not getting enough investment. Um, you're getting banks and large uh, pools of capital, private equity, hedge funds, uh, big investment funds are not uh, are divesting themselves of, of oil and gas or hydrocarbon investments. And so you're squeezing, the demand is going up, but you're squeezing the supply you are hindering the supply response. And that's why I think we will have an energy crisis. That's why I think prices will definitely trade over $100 a barrel, probably within 18 months. And quite frankly, I think it could go a lot higher, it could go to you know, the old, old highs and make new highs. We just you know, talked earlier in this video of why resource uh, markets tend to uh, go to extremes when they go to all-time highs or all-time lows. So, uh, you know, I haven't forgot, you know, uranium is the hot story, but the whole energy complex is on fire. I mean, for heaven's sakes, you've got natural gas is trading at, uh, you know, $5 in MCF. And the forecasting that I'm looking at is, again, I've pointed this out before, I think you're going to be shocked, I think, if uh, things go down like I'm, uh, like I'm forecasting. I'm, you know, we're seeing the forecasts I look at, 
a longer, an earlier start to winter, a longer winter, and a much colder winter than normal. And we just don't have, we haven't made the investments. You know, even the oil companies, the oil and gas companies are trying to be shareholder friendly. They're not just drill, baby, drill. All those managements are gone. They're purged. It's a new sheriff in town. There's not unlimited junk bond capital. There's not unlimited capital anymore. We did that. We, we went through two iterations of that. There's no appetite for that. It's live inside your cash flows and pay down debt and return capital to shareholders. There's no appetite yet, yet at these prices to just go crazy and drill and produce. Uh, you get to 150 or $200 a barrel, that could change. Um, so, but this is, this is what I'm looking at. The demand is coming back. The supply response will be inadequate. So here it is, you know, S&P or the uh, one of the ministers in OPEC, uh, Oman's energy and minerals minister said, let me read it. Global oil prices could soar to $200 a barrel if no new investments are made in the oil and gas sector in the short term, Oman's energy and minerals minister said September 9th in reply to the International Ag Energy Agency's assessment for reaching net zero emissions by 2050. The IEA said in a May 18th report, that under an energy scenario needed to put the world on a path to net zero emissions. I don't know what this means. Let me just stop here. What does that mean? That needs to be defined, net zero emissions. You cannot have modern civilization and have net zero emissions by 2050. This is stupid. It doesn't make any sense. It's just words. This is why you're going to have an energy crisis. Because this, is, this is what manifests as supposed policy. Anyways, there should be no... So let's go back here. Under an energy scenario needed to put the world on a path to net zero emissions by 2050, there should be no new oil and gas developments and that global oil demand would collapse by 75%. That's just simply not going to happen. It may happen in the US and in Western Europe and in you know some of these goofy countries like Australia or New Zealand. It's not going to happen in the rest of the world. People you know, have a, the governments of India, China, Philippines, Indonesia, they have a compact with their people. They have to deliver economic growth and it requires energy. And he ain't going to do it with windmills and solar exclusively. It's not going to happen. You need a petrochemical industry. You need fertilizers. You need plastics. All this stuff is hydrocarbon based. And everybody forgets that. Quote, my biggest fear if we stop investing in the fossil fuel industry abruptly is there will be an energy starvation and the price of energy will just shoot up. The demand for oil and gas may go down, but in the short term, we could see $100 a barrel or a $200 a barrel scenario, which although it sounds very attractive today to producers, it's something that I think many of us, if not all of us, would not like to see happening in the market. Well, personally, I wouldn't mind it happening because it would finally get it through to all these people that are living in fantasy world about what reality is. It would also be the right way to stimulate the alternatives. Having Joe Biden's cronies in the energy department parse out billions of dollars to rent seekers in these alternative energy things is not the way you do this. If you have a sustained price at these high levels, I can promise you the free market will come up with solutions. There will be demand destruction. There will be lifestyle changes. There will be new technologies that get developed. I have utmost confidence in entrepreneurs, scientists, and engineers to come up with uh, solutions. We don't need Joe Biden's rent-seeking uh, payoffs to cronies. We already saw this during the previous administrations. Solyndra, anyone? We can go right down the list. But uh, this is going to happen regardless because we haven't had the uh, we haven't had the investment. It's going to happen. So, you know, why not profit off it? That's how you hedge yourself, right? Even, you know, and a lot of people will be biased against us. Say, well, I don't like this. I'm green. I don't like what you're saying. I'm not, you know, it doesn't matter what you like. Uh, tell me we're going to get the equivalent of 100 million barrels a day of energy to, uh, you know, power the world. You can't tell me where you're going to get it. You can't tell me where you're going to get the feedstocks for all of those things all the things we take for granted, the paint, the, the, the plastics, the, you know, everything, the varnishes, the nail polish, the, you know, agricultural inputs that go into the ground, nitrogen, this is based from natural gas, all the chemical industry, all the things that we take for granted and don't have a clue about that just seem to happen magically 
uh, isn't going to happen at a net zero uh, emission target, whatever that means. So uh, this is a tremendous opportunity because the, the, the mismatch between reality and, the, and, and this policies is so stark. If you get it, it's going to be transformational for your life. And if you don't get it, you're just going to be sitting there putting, you know, $8 gasoline into your F-250 wondering what happened. So here's Alex Epstein. Uh, you should read his book. He's got a good book. I think I believe it's called The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. It's pretty good. So I follow him on Twitter. Uh, talking about the energy crisis. I like these little anecdotal things, little things I like to bring to your attention. Not just one-offs. It just keeps building. And so Generac says in a recent, Generac a company that makes emergency generators that run off natural gas and diesel. You can go on their website, you can get one for your house. Anyways, Generac says in a recent investor presentation that power outage severity is, quote, increasing significantly. Between 2000 and 2020, the number of what the energy department calls major electrical disturbances and unusual occurrences jumped 13 fold. So that's a result of you know, bad policy, uh, adding too many renewables, not upgrading the grid. It's not just one thing, it's many things. You know, having these dumb mandates like they have where you're just going to force these things down without really, you know, looking at the underlying engineering and math uh, situation before you do it. Um, you know, that's what's causing a lot of this stuff. So that you know, need to rebuild the grid. There's a whole bunch of things that happen, but you know this is this again is hundreds of billions of dollars that haven't been spent, and so we're just going to magically dictate from you know the state capitals or the or Washington D.C. that these these things will happen. They'll just happen because we passed legislation, and you know aren't we wonderful? And you know how do you get from uh, A to B? There's no uh, there's no there there, and this is what you end up with. So here's what I was talking about earlier. UK fires up old coal plant due to high gas prices. The UK fired up an old coal plant Monday to meet its electricity needs. Warm, still autumn weather has meant wind farms have not generated as much power as normal. Oh, wow. Too bad. While soaring prices have made it too costly to rely on gas. A national grid spokesman said there had been a three-day coal-free run in mid-August, but the country had relied on some coal power every day since then. Yes, and coal prices, guess what, are at very, very high levels that we haven't seen for a decade. And I think they're going to be going higher and staying there for a while. We've made tremendous money in BTU. Somebody asked me today, I think on one of the uh, comments of one of the videos, where I thought BTU would go. You know, this is another thing. I don't know because it's hard to analyze these companies. They were on the ver ver verge of bankruptcy, and now the prices have jumped so fast that we haven't had enough couple quarters or so to see what the cash flows are going to be to really do a full analysis. So there's a lot of speculation there. I mean, my original target when I bought PTU, I was thinking, okay, maybe it gets back to $20 a share, but that was just kind of based on looking at the charts. There's no like financial analysis involved. And so I don't know, can it go to 25, 30? It's, it's knocking on the door at 20 now. It's like 18. We were buying it at three or four. So, um, you know, this, I don't know. It's the same thing with these uranium stocks. I, I don't know how high they can go. A lot higher than they are. I, I, I know that sounds, uh, that's not copping out. It's just how it is in a lot of these speculative type situations. You know, if you get a year or two or a couple few quarters under your belt, then okay, we can start doing some analysis based on uh, previous cycles. But right now I got no info. Prices have moved so quickly, so high, it's hard to you know, put up a model. And I'm not that guy, I'm not a financial analyst. I, I, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm doing a lot of this by the gut. And I know people don't like that, but I'm not gonna sit here with a green eye shades and a 40 watt light bulb in the basement with an abacus figuring out what BTU's cash flows are gonna be at certain coal prices. You know, coal's at a decade high. The price is going to go higher. That's all I can tell you. Ho hum, another record for coal prices is in China. You know, they want to make a political point with Australia so they don't allow the importation of metallurgical coal from Australia. So they've had to scrounge around other places um, and try to get coal. So the prices, you know, have moved up. 
And so uh, this is a uh, tweet. We're tired of reporting China's coal futures hit record highs. Lots of laughs. Most traded coking coal futures in Dalian gained over 5% to hear, hit a new record of 2,988 yuan per ton, approaching the 3,000 yuan mark. Coke gains 4% and thermal cane coal gains 3%, both hitting record highs. So we're just seeing more and more of that, right? Um, there just hasn't been enough investment. And coal is like, you know, people like uranium and they like oil, but coal, I mean, forget about it. It's like the, it's like, it's like if the tobacco companies, right? I mean, they squeezed them, they couldn't advertise, they put regulations to try to curtail it, raise taxes on, on it. And people were so addicted to cigarettes, they kept smoking and their cash flows were so huge. They were some of the best perform. They have been some of the best performing stocks in the history of the stock market, and you have something similar, if not quite the same, right? You coal, uh, met coal, you need for about eighty percent of your steel making that goes on because happens from the uh, basic basic oxygen furnace methodology, which we've shown before and talked about before, and uh, you know thermal coal for uh, electricity production or or heating in uh, a lot of areas, and, and I know in Eastern Europe where I live in Ukraine. Um, they have central thermal plants. They'll be turning them on around October 1st and they leave them running until like April of the next year. That's, you know, you have the steam systems that go throughout the city or hot water delivery systems and uh, it's all coal powered. And so coal is not going away. And now, you know, with gas prices through the roof, anybody that can switch to coal has been doing it. And, you know, the thing about it is, is I just saw another mine. We've talked about this before too. We showed the mine in Canada. It was like an $800 million coking coal project that got canceled. And I just saw another project. I don't know where it was. I think it was in, I can't remember, but it was another big project that got canceled. And I'm thinking to myself, the demand doesn't even have to grow for coal. It can just go down slowly over time. But if the supply is being choked off, I mean, if you own a built and producing coal mine, you're sitting on a jackpot for, because you're basically having the government, in many cases, enact you monopoly status or put you in uh, a duopoly or something like that because there's no competitors. These prices being at record highs should stimulate more companies building more mines. And you're going to see less of that because of the current zeitgeist and everybody hates hating on coal. I mean, like I said, divestment of investments. Nobody's going to finance the thing. Well, the Chinese and Russians probably will, but you know, insufficient investment and then permitting problems. So it's like, you know, it's the perfect setup. If you already have the sunk cost and, and, and have an existing mine and infrastructure, you're sitting in the cuckoo bird seat. So you know, I'm I'm looking at other coal mining companies that trade in Indo or, or Indonesian or even China based. I mean, they're tremendous value still, double digit dividends single low single digit PEs. It's crazy. You know, in the portfolio, I, I recommended selling uh, our, our one of our coal holdings, which was Mongolia mining, which it was up about 80%. But you know, I just, you know, I'm not going to get into the, I'll do another video about that. And, and, and one of the container ship companies that I blew it on. But, um, you know, since I've sold it, it's up about another 50%. So um, I think that if you have some of these assets and you have the government basically helping you choking off your competitors um, and you got a mine that's sitting there that has, you know, 10, 20, 30 years of reserves, like I said, you're in the cuckoo bird seat because coal ain't going away. So uh, interesting concept to think about. That's what we talk about in actionable intelligence alert, right? Uh, these things that nobody else talks about or think it through beyond just, you know, the headline. They ought to have me on Fox Business News. That'll never happen. Here we go again. Coal prices up, supply down. Coking coal surges, supply dips. Global coking coal export volumes versus coking coal price. So obviously the um, blue uh, vertical bars are global seaborne coking coal exports. You can see they've been trending down. The price is going up. This is basic uh, economics 101. I know this is just a short, uh, you know, this isn't that big, but you see the marginal. I mean, you had 25 million tons in June 
and you're down to a little bit over 20, it doesn't take much of a turn. It's not like this has to get cut in half. It can be a one or 2% change can make the price of a commodity go up a hundred percent. That's that, that's how tight these things are. That's the marginal. That's what I'm talking about. The marginal ton, the marginal barrel, the marginal ounce, the marginal pound. If you require it for your, for your blast furnace, you will overpay. Maybe somebody else will say, well, I'm not going to pay that. So I'll lay, I'll lay, I'll shut it down for three months. That's the economic decisions that people make. It's called price rationing. If the stuff isn't there. And that's why the marginal cost can, like I said, make, now if you have this asset and you have the orders and it makes economic sense, you'll outbid for that. You need that coal more than the other person, you'll outbid for them. That's how the price can go up significantly. That's the point I'm trying to make. All right, guys, that's it for this week. I uh, hope you got something out of this video. If you did, uh, you know what to do. Like it, comment. Um, if you think I'm off base on something, let me know in the comments. I'm happy to discuss. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'm feeling really pretty good about the energy uh, situation we're in. I'm trying not to look at my portfolio. It's doing really good. Um, we're really destroying the uh, uh, S&P this uh, quarter, this whole year. Uh, it's been really good. And uh, like I said, if you're interested to know what we're doing, um, we buy undervalued things. We sell overvaluation and buy undervaluation. It's not just resource stocks. We've got a whole a bunch of other things. I mean, if somebody asks me, well, what am I looking at now? I'm looking at, you know, Greek banks that they're cheap. I'm not buying them yet. I mean, this is kind of wild stuff I look at, you know, emerging markets. Okay. Uzbekistan, you know, even Russia is still cheap, even though it's up. I own the ETF. You know, it's like, you know, there's always something cheap that's on the verge or in the process of having an inflection. And that's what we research for you. You have to make the world your oyster. It's not just about, you know, four or five tech stocks and Bitcoin. There's a whole plethora of make the world your oyster. And that's what we do. So if you're interested, consider a subscription to Actionable Intelligence Alert. We got the Patreon for five bucks. If you become a Patreon supporter, you can cancel it the same month. Doesn't matter. You can leave it running if you want to support us. I will send you the most current stock pick in the portfolio. That's a one-time deal, one shot. Why am I willing to do that? Because I want you to get a flavor, a sense of what we're doing, okay? What kind of companies we're looking at, what our thought process is. And I'm confident that if I send you that and you give me the five bucks, that you're going to say, hey, th this, this, th this, this matches my uh, wanting to buy things that are cheap and sell them when they're expensive. So uh, consider that. All right, guys, that's it for this week. Uh, appreciate the support and we'll talk to you next week.